If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. All right, so in this episode, um, Adam, Justin, and I got the opportunity to interview a good friend of ours, Josiah Novak. Now, he... We got in contact with him a long time ago because he started listening to our podcast. So this is probably almost three years ago where he would contact us and, you know, we'd reply and, and talk with him back and forth. And he just showed a lot of promise. Uh, very smart dude, very charismatic, good looking fit, seemed to have the right message. And it's been really awesome to watch him. Um, succeed in the fitness space. He now has a podcast that's been on air for about a year. It's called The Fit Man Project. I, in fact, if you like Mind Pump, I, I implore you to go check out his podcast. He's he's very open, very raw, um, great interviews, great conversations, and just you know, is another fitness podcast um, in our space that's promoting a good and honest message and it's good to see more good people like Josiah succeed. He's actually one of our one of our favorite people. Um, he has a website, uh, the true transformation.com and his Instagram page is Josiah Fitness. That's J O S I A H Fitness. Um, so check him out. Great information. He's uh, again he's one of those few people with a lot of integrity um, and uh, enough self awareness to know that he, in order to bring the right information to you, he's got to get the experts um, and then comment on the stuff that he feels like he he knows a lot about. You don't feel like he's bullshitting you, basically, when you hear the guy talking. So, again, one of our favorite people. Um, also, this month um, is uh, January. Lots of people getting started in fitness. And rather relatively recently, we've noticed a new influx of brand new people. And we have lots of programs on our website, lots of fitness programs. And one of the most common questions that we get is, where should I start? The fitness program that we offer that we think we consider to be our foundational program, the one where we think most people should start in, is MAPS Anabolic. And consistently, when we ask people, when we do surveys, which fitness program of ours did you enjoy the most, MAPS Anabolic is always up there. And I think it's because when people do a MAPS program for the first time and they choose MAPS Anabolic and they've it's so different from their traditional body part split training or it's so different from what they thought was effective training that when they do it, they're blown away. They're blown away by the results and so they identify strongly with MAPS Anabolic. It's definitely our most popular program. It's found in a lot of our bundles. Um, well, um, it's available on our site, mindpumpmedia.com. Now, if you enroll in a bundle that includes any of our MAPS programs, but combined. So we have like the Build Your Butt Bundle, which is MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Aesthetic, or the Sexy Athlete Bundle, or the Super Bundle, which includes a lot of our programs. Any bundle this month comes with a free Mind Pump t-shirt. These are limited edition. Um, they're, people love them. They're really soft. They fit really well. Um, so that's the promotion for the month. Enroll in any bundle, get a free t-shirt. But if you're just getting started and you don't want to make that kind of a commitment, the place to start, we believe, for most people, is MAPS Anabolic. Again, you can find this all at mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are talking to our friend Josiah from the Fit Man Project podcast. Yeah, I will say you. this, dude. Huh? You are extra cuddly when you're sick, though. It's very difficult. I want to hug to, you. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I want to like uh, give you yeah. something. Are, are you yeah. what? What are you guys all like? Like when you're sick, are you irritable or are you like just whatever guy? I mean, I'm I'm kind of like just real lazy. Like I I just can barely move, you know. So I just take it as it is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you tell I, me what to do. I'm like I'm doing it now. Is your is your wife a really is Courtney a really good nurse at home or is because she's a nurse she doesn't she's a terrible nurse? <laughs> it depends. Yeah, sometimes she's terrible. <laughs> That's true. Wants to like how frustrating is that? You're oh, like man. fucking my wife's a nurse and she sucks like, at taking on, care honey. of me. Come on, honey. You know <laughs> you know what it this is. is your opportunity. <laughs> I think because she's a nurse. Yeah, her her, like, her sympathy. If she might think like, all right, you're being a pussy now. Get up. Yes. And, Oh, that's what, that's what happens yeah. most of the time. Yeah, but if I'm like be. really sick, then she's like, oh, I'm going to make you chicken soup yeah. and we're going to get all this worked out. I'm I like, cool. am a baby, dude. Yep, yeah. dude. Yep, yep. I am like zero to a hundred, bro. Yeah. Yep. Like it's crazy. It, it pisses me off. I'm such a baby. Yeah, over. You're remember- hard to be around when you're sick. You don't, <laughs> you don't let people. Did you hear me, man? Yeah. You don't let people take care of you, man. 
You're like I, you sit there and you're like angry. I, I am angry. Yeah. You know, it's I I don't I didn't realize how much it like just irritates me to be knocked down like that. <laughs> you just so, like you can't handle the non-productive no, you know nature of being no. sick. Oh, dude, it just drives me it drives me crazy. And I yeah. feel like I but you get horny too. You said oh, yeah, that's weird. Really? Yeah. yeah. yeah he said he said that so many times. I tried. Yeah, it didn't didn't work out. Well, six got, sex is the best, dude. Yeah. Six sex? Yeah. <laughs> I like six sex. That's a cool play, like word combination there. Yeah, yeah dude. Six sex. Six sex. I'm a, I'm a little bitch when I'm, when I'm sick. You really? are too? Oh. Drama queen, dude. Yeah, <laughs> I am too. So Full on man cold action. So yep. so you guys want to hear something funny. So uh, there's the whole stereotype, right, of the, the man cold or how men are more dramatic when they're sick and, you know, yeah. not able to handle being sick as much as women. I make a lot of noises. And uh, what's uh, what's, <laughs> yeah. what's funny, you know what's funny, is a lot of stereotypes uh, are based on some biology. Now, I'm not saying this one is, but I'm going to speculate. So we're going to enter into speculation I love world. how you bring the science in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is, coming in no, hot. this is not science. Okay. This is Sal speculating. Oh, this is Sal speculation. Okay. okay. First off, there is some science to support what I'm about to speculate because they did do some studies on this, and I can we'll put in the show notes, where they found that men do perceive, uh, that they'll perceive the same cold as worse. So they'll infect men and women, and the men will have more severe symptoms oh, I believe that. than the women. And <laughs> men are more prone to uh, severe symptoms from certain types of infections, stuff like that. And the same is true for women for other types. But when it comes to like a cold or the flu, men do perceive the symptoms to be worse. So it begs the question, are we in fact weaker or is it because we perceive the sickness to be worse. Mm. So here's my speculation. I think that women oh deal with more like shit like that. So they they their perception of it is different than ours. Yeah. Like get pregnancy, a period every single month. That just seems like a <laughs> that's, motherfucker. That's right? a great point. The oh, period, yeah. especially. No, I'm serious. Because women, I mean, you, a lot of women. They're not used all to women. just feeling awful at least once a month. Yeah. They feel awful. A and lot of women literally get sick every so they, month. So they think like a little cold. Like you're a little like I. I feel like such a bitch when Katrina and I get sick with like the same virus yeah. <laughs> and she gets up and goes to work and I'm laying yeah. in bed all day long going, yeah. oh, watching 16 yeah, and pregnant. Yeah. She's doing jumping jacks. So here's my, so here's my other side of it. Cause you're that I think plays a major factor also, but here's another side of speculation. So if we evolved as hunter gatherers, right, it's pretty well established that the men or the males were the hunters and the females of the tribes were the gatherers. And gathering means you stay behind, you have your, the children, you're searching for roots, nuts, you know, berries, seeds, whatever, you're building communities, you're communicating with the other women, you're deciding you know, how things are going to run or whatever. Now, the men are off hunting. Now, when you're hunting, you don't talk a lot, especially when you're tracking what you're going to kill. You just can't. You can't say that much stuff. Yeah. And if one person fucking is loud or slow... The whole tribe suffers. So you think everybody you doesn't eat, sneezing and coughing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, go home, so, bro. Bury but that shit. now, on the flip side, if you are sick and you're, uh, uh, you know, and you're a gatherer and you're back with the tribe, then it makes sense for the other women to show to work together because it, it's not as big of a detriment if you're sneezing or a little slow. You still help. You still can help. But if you're a hunter, you might still be able to run and throw a spear and stuff like that. But if you're off by a little bit, because Humans hunt in packs. This is pretty well established, and we run animals down. If one of those things is off a little bit, you fuck everybody up. So maybe men evolve to perceive being sick as worse, so that we stay behind for the betterment of the tribe. That's not okay. a bad theory. You like a that? Theory, yeah. I like that. I like that. Really I'm gonna tell my wife that next time. I, I, yeah. <laughs> so basically, what I did is I tried to make something negative. Turn it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Turn it to a positive, yeah. <laughs> which is basically what I just did. Yeah, no, I can't talk. The evolution shit, of man. Cold. Hashtag South Science. Yeah. So anyway, did you guys watch the football games last night? I yes, know you did. Yes. Football. I know yes, just I did. did. There was like ten baskets. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> I was. 50, I knew 50, the Patriots man. were gonna take it. So yeah. So who was your Tom team? Brady. Just, uh, well, I mean, I'm a Tom Brady fan, dude. Forty. Oh, yeah. What is he? Forty one now. Yeah, how is can you? That? How can you oh, not? My yeah, buddies hate he's, on him all the time, and I'm he's like, a, he's a how beast, can dude. you? He's the best. Yeah, he is. You know, great. Well, I hate to say that because I'm a Joe Montana, you know, forever guy, but yeah, he's, he's a, surpassed him a long time ago. Dude, he's living the dream, right? Hot wife, oh, making yeah. just stupid money. Yeah, eighteen. How many Super Bowls now is this number? This is number eight, right? That he's going to. He's yeah. going to. Wow. Yeah. eight or nine, dude. He's My got God, a ton of them. Mm. Well, he's only lost. How many has he lost? One or two? Two. Two. He's lost the Giants. Both. Both of them were the Giants? Yeah, both of them. Oh, wow. Mm. 
I thought just one. So of they're them, going to the, the Super stings. Bowl. We don't know who they're playing against. No, they're playing yeah. against uh, Philly. Yeah. Philly. Okay. Eagles. The Eagles, yeah, Eagles took it to. They took uh, hammered the Minnesota. woodshed, man. So hammered is Minnesota. it safe to say that the safe yeah. bet then is on Brady? Safe bet, probably. Yeah. Because the backup quarterback situation, but no, actually, I mean, I was just thinking, damn, if Philly pulls it off, who's who? How how does Wentz feel? Yeah, that's gonna be <laughs> the, well. Yeah. So, well, he's gonna it's gonna suck that he wasn't in there, and yeah. but they're saying that no matter what, next year Wentz still will be the still starter. The starter. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. Yeah, he was yeah. he's MVP this year, right? I mean, yeah. right behind him I and mean, Brady. Yeah, no, I agree too. I think it's I think if they were if they had Wentz right now, that this would be they would yeah. roll everybody up. Agreed. Because he's that he's that good, and to actually, I did not think. I thought when he went down, I thought, oh, that sucks. This I feel he had a chance this year, but to see them rolling everybody up still without without your starting quarterback, that's oh, yeah. you got the team, bro. You have a it's Super Bowl team backup there. quarterback stepping up and making Nick Foles yeah. making it happen. Now dude. in Foles' defense, Foles has played a lot too. Yeah. He's not like some bum, you know what I'm saying? Like right. he's a good, he's a solid quarterback, especially. For I bet he'll get offers next year. To well, yeah, another of team. Yeah, you know? no, yeah. That's, I mean, if you're him, I mean, you're you're pump no matter what even though you they you know because you know there's some people that were like oh he's gonna have all this animosity because he's gonna have to sit behind wince i'm like nah fuck that someone's gonna pay him no, top dollar gonna pick him up dude yeah someone mm. will pay him top dollar the browns <laughs> the browns are <laughs> God damn, the browns dude it's, you got it like, so unfortunate it's like if that's, your, bad if that's your team man yeah. Yeah. oh that's, man you gotta you, you you switch over to basketball, you know if that's the case. You're in, yeah, you're in LeBron mode. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck the yeah. football. Let's football just go shit. that direction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Josiah, how's everything going, man? With the with what you're doing, you got your podcast going on. You got some online stuff. We we haven't talked to you or met with you for how, when, when was it that we 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 were with you? That was July, actually, of this past Damn, year. Has it been that long? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it hasn't months, been that long, but it has been a long months. time. And, and yeah. yeah, in our world, you know, the podcast you don't world. see each other for a couple months. It feels like it's yeah. forever. So a lot has happened for you since yeah. then. Let's give us the rundown. Well, yeah, a lot has happened. Did uh, you have your podcast on air then? I or? did. Yeah, no, you guys came on the show in July. That's right. Um, That's right. We were six months into we podcast. That's that right. Day. It was it was really really new. That was yeah. That was when I uh, the podcast skyrocketed. I think you guys yeah. probably tripled my downloads. Whoa! <laughs> That's awesome. You know what? There, That's not even a joke, actually. But oh, wow. no, there's an Sick. there's an effect. The forum, man. The mind pump effect. <laughs> yeah. There's a mind pump effect. Two two other podcasts have told us that. Well, it's kind of cool. Yeah, whatever. Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan told awesome. us that because apparently we Joe Rogan. <laughs> Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah, those mind pumps. Checks guys in the mail. Yeah, yeah. Checks in the mail. Yeah. yeah. No. So your so your podcast took off. Yeah, podcast is rocking, man. Actually, Sweet. right after that, we got our first sponsor with uh, Mike Matthews over at Legion. Uh, Legion. Uh, Mike Matthews is a yeah. fucking great guy. Yeah. Dude. Very, and I'm glad you guys are working together because mm-hmm. you guys are both good people. He's quality, He's a good yeah. Dude. Family guy, yeah, he's awesome. So it skyrocketed, man. We started getting on a lot more uh, guests with you know bigger reach and whatnot. Um, and so, I mean, it's, truth be told, when I started the podcast, right from the beginning, it was a labor of love, man. I said, you know, I'm not really trying to monetize this at all. I'm doing it because I enjoy talking to people and I enjoy having conversations with people like yourselves. Uh, and maybe down the road, it'll become something that builds the business and we can monetize and expand with it. And it it, it is now something we monetize slightly, uh, but it's still a labor of love, man. I mean, it's my passion. Like I love just having conversations with people. Uh, and I'm blessed now that with technology and the podcasting world exploding, dude, I feel like everybody has a podcast now. It's true. Yeah. It's such a, it's an easy way to get your foot in the door with someone or just connect, man. Like if you're trying to do something on any kind of level, whether if it's just building a relationship or expanding your business relationships, uh, podcasting is just a great, I call it the business card uh, for me now to get in the door with people. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. an easy oh, way. Oh, it gives you crazy leverage. Like yeah. there's no way in hell I'll it's be able to talk to. It's the new way to network, man. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to talk to half the people that we talked to if I didn't have a podcast and I said, hey, I have this podcast you can be on. Yeah, dude. So I mean, what, some so some interesting observations that we've been kind of making with pod, because you're right, it has really exploded relatively recently like it, I, bro when we started mind pump three years ago when i would tell somebody uh if i was going to you know talk about the podcast i used to have to ask them do you know what a podcast is because mm-hmm. a lot of people most people didn't even know what it was. they wouldn't even know what a podcast was and now i don't say that anymore now i say what podcast do you listen to and more often than not there's they're familiar with at least you know one so there's that but here's something else because you're talking about sponsorships so I don't know, halfway through or right right around when we started monetizing Mind Pump with our programs, people would ask us about sponsorships and we'd be like, nah, there's no money in sponsorships until you get really, really big. You're not going to make that much money. But what's starting to happen now, which is kind of strange, is we're talking to companies and uh, they're saying things to us like, we have this much 
uh, budget allotted to podcasting. So now that they have a marketing budget, it used to be that the marketing budget was, you know, whatever, radio, TV, Billboards. Facebook, you know, Instagram. And now they're, everybody's budgeting podcasting. And what's cool about this is if, if you are a podcaster and you're decent, right? Because if there's a lot that are terrible, aren't going to do anything. But if you're decent, you have somewhat of a reach. The real estate for advertising is limited. There's only so many top 50 podcasts in it's each category. It's driving it up. The, the cost of sponsorships is going, even if your podcast doesn't grow, what you're going to find is that the amount that you can charge for sponsor because is going up because the real estate is limited. And I mean, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. It's pretty cool to see right now. Yeah. We just talk on, uh, I believe you guys are sponsored by them too, Health IQ. Mm. Yeah. I got introduced to them through Ryan Mickler, who you guys had on the show as well, mm -hmm. Order a Man. And uh, yeah, I was actually pleasantly surprised to hear numbers from them based off our reach. I was expecting a you know slightly lower number, but yeah, dude. I mean, and it's just like you said, it's supply and demand. So I mean, there's there's a lot of podcasts, but I would still argue there's not a lot of great podcasts. Yeah, so like, yeah. for sure. Agree if you're with that. good, um, and feedback on our show is that we are good, which <laughs> you know that's great. Um, then you can start to utilize that to your advantage for sure, mm -hmm. and we are. Uh, but we're we're also being strategic. I mean. You know, that's not our main revenue stream. Uh, it's still something we're just, pa I'm passionate about. And so uh, we're careful with who we bring on, who we mm. associate with. Mike was was definitely someone we wanted now, to. Now, how long have you been on air now total? So if it, One year, so actually, been as of almost today. So we, I remember how much we grew um, on the podcast in that first year, like the difference. Have you, what, what, what have you, what's, what's gotten better with you? Like what have you changed and grown with that period of time? That's a good question, man. Um, Do you ever I, listen to your first episodes and then hell compare? No, dude, I, I hate listening <laughs> to my voice, man. It's like the worst. It's like listening to voice, like a nasally dude. fucking adolescent. That's what I think. And then people tell me, oh, you got a radio voice, dude. It's awesome. But I, I actually recently have started listening to the episodes simply because I've had some really quality guests on. And I want to go back and just kind of listen to what they said and digest it a little bit more and get more of the knowledge bombs that people drop. But uh, for, as far as what we've gotten better at, I mean, we hired a team to start editing it and then repurposing it as well. So putting it on YouTube so people can listen on YouTube because we found that that's actually a big medium for people to listen to shows. Mm -hmm. I know Rogan gets you know so many views on his podcast episodes on there. So we started doing that. Um, and then just utilizing the network that we're building, man. I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? So how can I now work my way onto podcasts like yours, right? Because the first year was just how many people can get, how many people can I get on the show right? That are going to help me grow mm -hmm. and expand our, our, our reach. But then now it's like the goal this year is to release, you know, 150 episodes of our show, but also be on 50 other podcasts. Mm -hmm. That's a great goal. Yeah. yeah. No, nothing moves the, you know, uh, the needle of growth on a podcast, like getting on another, yeah. obviously in doing a good job. <coughs> Which is challenging. It's tricky. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say that's challenging. Oh yeah. It's yeah. not easy, man. I'm, I'm like, even sitting here right now, I'm so used to being in the driver's seat as far as the conversation goes. Right. And so mm -hmm. it takes a lot for me once I get on someone's show to be like, all right, let me, let me just, you know, hear their question and give a, a quality answer. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Not just <laughs> <laughs> take over the mic. Yeah. Do you prefer interviewing so versus being that. interviewed? I would say, yeah, I probably prefer interviewing more because I get to ask all the questions that I really want to know. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, but once again, though, being interviewed for me is probably more difficult. So it's a challenge. And so I have to, I have to do more of it because I'm not as good, um, you know, at being interviewed as I am as, you know, interviewing someone. So it's something that I'm excited about because it's an area of improvement for sure. See, that's funny. I think I like, I think I like to be interviewed more than I like interviewing, not simply because it's, uh, I feel losing. like it's easier. Yeah, it's easier. Mm, yeah. Like yeah. I actually feel like I'm with you though, Josiah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like to ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's easier. I don't like it being all about me. Yeah. Plus, I feel yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these fucking egos over Come here. Come on, man. You know, <laughs> maybe, I maybe love being interviewed. Hey, yeah. There's a oh there's my a, god, I love when people. Yeah, pay there's a lot of me all day. There's yeah. a lot of so truth in that. Hashtag me. If we're being really self-aware, yeah. There's a little bit of truth in that. Definitely. Yeah, maybe I feel like I don't get to say enough when I'm on this show. Fucking Sal talks too much. Get to say enough. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that is classic. Jesus. Yeah, we should funny. track that, right? Yeah. Track total time talked. I would love that. Well, that yeah. might change too for me. I mean, after this year and doing 50 other shows, uh, I might find that I do enjoy being interviewed more, right? It's just, I think it, for me, I'm so used to like just asking. Maybe it's a control factor too. You know, I like being in control of where the conversation goes. Sometimes I go into an interview recently on some shows that are not fitness based. 
and they want to talk about certain things that are a little uncomfortable. And I'm like, oh man, all right, well, this is going to be challenging. It's not something I'm used to. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean not fitness based? What were they? What were they on? So business based, family based. Um, actually, went on one that was about uh, pornography, which Ooh. you know, pornography and how it impacts you as a dad and, and husband and whatnot. And that was oh actually shit, really, really crazy. Hook man. me up with that. Yeah, yeah, it was. I'll get was on that. Interesting a, conversation. Yeah, that's got to be really interesting. What was? Yeah. I mean, what's the idea of their show? That I mean, do you literally? It's all about pornography. No, or, it was just was that just that topic. Just that topic of the episode. Yeah. You guys know Vince Del Monte? Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. We're, we're with yeah. him uh, next two weeks. Yeah, so Are we? We, okay. we talked yeah. about porn, uh, which is, <laughs> it was a good conversation, man. I mean, uh, but yeah, it was it was a little challenging. And so, yeah, it's just those, those what, conversations. Well, what did he, really what did he ask you that was so crazy? I mean, what, was What's it a your le- favorite porn? Was it, yeah, no, was it like- What like, did you go to? <laughs> did you not have to admit this? Yeah. Did you not know it was coming or was it totally in left field? Well, it was just kind of where the conversation took us, um, but it was it was somewhat planned ahead, yeah, because he, he's been talking a lot about masculinity um, and porn and how it impacts guys and, and our marriage and whatnot. And so it just kind of was the topic at hand because we both come from similar backgrounds. You know, he's a Christian, I'm a Christian. And, uh, you know, we both have kids, uh, both have two kids and a wife. And it was just something he's battled with, actually, you know, with addiction and some of the, the things he's had to put in place to to get over it have been incredible. And so just talking about addiction, and because I come from a history of addiction with my family. Mm. And I feel like porn is definitely something that if you give it the shot, you know, give it a chance, you can fall deep into that. Addiction, totally. Man. Totally. Yeah. Joe, you're you're right. I mean, you're a little younger than we are, but we're in the kind of a similar age range in terms of generation. And this thing keeps coming up, this whole like masculinity. Mas- I haven't heard people talk about- We talked about it like three years ago. I haven't heard yeah. people, anybody talk about masculinity as much uh, as I'm hearing now. Like recently. As if, uh, almost like there's a crisis of masculinity. Would mm-hmm. you agree that that, do you think that that's totally. happening? Absolutely, man. I've been, uh, I went on uh, Ryan Mickler. Well, I went to Ryan Mickler's event from Order of Man. I was a guest speaker there. Uh, over the summer. And it was a group of about 200 men that showed up uh, from his order of man tribe. And man, some of the stories I heard like broke my heart because at this stage of my life, right, I have two little boys. Um, I come from a history of abuse and addiction. And uh, a big passion of mine right now is improving as a father, right? Improving as a man. And speaking of the guys there, man, I was like, holy shit, dude. Like we do have a crisis. I feel like at least if you take that population and that sample size, right? Uh, but yeah, everywhere I look, there's this kind of what does it mean to be a man topic, right? Like, mm-hmm. where are we going as men? Or and I and I think, and it's just my theory, but I'm sure it's in reaction to um, a lot of the uh, movements that we see in other parts of of the world, right? When it comes to you know gender equality um, mm-hmm. and gender expression, you know, am I a man? Am I a woman? Um, the gay lesbian uh, movement and and the things that we're seeing, the progress we're seeing in those areas, I think that men. I don't know if they feel threatened or maybe it's just like, hey, we need help too, right? Like, I th- we're I, out here too. I, I 100% think that there is a crisis of masculinity, but I don't mm. think when we hear the word crisis, we, we think of bad. I don't necessarily think it's bad. I think it's just a massive, very quick shift and change that has happened in a very short period of time. That's all I think it is. Whether it's good or bad, we'll, be, we'll, we'll find out, but... For millennia, for most of human civilization, uh, there are ways that men and women and humans have acted and developed cultures around because they work, okay? Because they've worked historically. And the way that they've worked historically now is being challenged. So what I mean by that is men historically have been you know, uh, you know, breadwinners, we, we, or we, we protect, we're needed for those types of things, hunting, you know, uh, providing the, you know, the, the resources, uh, women were responsible for distribution of the resources. They were responsible for, you know, nesting and uh, child rearing and those types of, so these are the, of course, the stereotypical gender roles, but they're based on, they've been around for a long time. They've been around since the beginning. Mm-hmm. They're, 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 they're based on, and they'll show, I mean, this, by the way, this is all a hundred percent backed by science. This is not a, you know, sexist thing to say. This is all, you know, in the literature, uh, men, for example, will, when they're seeking a mate, they will seek a cross and down from the, the hierarchy, you know, matrix or whatever. So they're looking for a woman that is on the same level on the hierarchy ladder and below them and typically younger and women will typically look above or across. So uh, it's more likely that a woman's are going to be attracted to a man who has higher income, higher status, 
um, uh, and maybe even a higher IQ. And the reverse is also true. And this you can go down the list. You can look at uh, you know a, a woman's IQ. The higher it gets, it's also strongly correlated to the less chance she's going to find a mate and be with them for a long time. Now, there's lots of reasons for this. I'm just stating the, 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 the facts. So right now, we have a society that's extremely safe. So you don't need to like be super protect, you know, protecting as a man. You don't need to hunt, really. Mm-hmm. Women have incredible earning power, and they actually kill us in education. So women are far more educated. If you look at the total number of people in college or you know, in formal education, women actually... Uh, are higher than men. So now we've got these, and, and these are not just cultural because they've been with us for so long. They're also biological. So there's there's both components. So now you have a man born today where uh, the education system really is geared around the female brain. And also don't forget the individual variance between people's massive. So these are vast generalizations. You can have a man who's very much uh, very different and a woman that's that's very, very different. But generally... You have, uh, you, you, you know, men, there's no longer that, that role that we were both biologically, you know, connected to through evolution and culturally, and our culture is very old. It's, it's been around for a long time. So it's like, what do I do? Who am I? Where do I and go? And this has only been happening for a very short period of time. Not right long. Yeah. yeah, this yeah. is when you talk about the, the big picture, like you are taking it all the way back and talking about evolution. And, like, I, and I have to say that because people get confused and they're like, no, that's the... The patriarchy, that society, that's no, right. no, 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 no. This is it's been going on for a long time, man. forever. And so men today it's been passed on, on. yeah. And so men today are like, what the like? What it's do the I do? Decline of the modern man. Where do I go? Yeah. Like, what's happening? Because a lot of testosterone traits, uh, they're not attractive anymore, like they used to be. Right? Now, like, my what I dad bods are in. What I'm curious about, and what I love to speculate about, is are we seeing the pendulum swinging hard one way right now, and you're going to see it recorrect? Or are we going to keep going in this direction to where we almost become the same sex? Yeah, I don't know. What do you like, think, Josiah? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, with two little boys, I hope, Adam, I hope you're right. I hope we're going to swing in the other direction. Um, just simply because I, I do think there is a need for strong gender identification on both sides, right? I think that we need strong masculinity as well as strong feminine um, qualities because both serve a, a role and there's no equal or lesser or anything of that nature. It's just very useful for They're extremely important. F- yeah. For how we develop and how, you know, like I, a I healthy do a partnership. Exactly. I mean, I do a lot of research on uh, boys who are raised with out of dad, right? Because that's where I come from. Uh, or at least not a, a present father figure. And the statistics are, are pretty insane, man, as far as what kind of future those kids could be facing, um, getting in trouble, let's, being in let's the judicial dive in, system. Let's dive stuff. into that a little bit because, you know, when you interviewed me, we, we talked a lot about my childhood and you, and you referenced you and I being almost identical, but obviously you were interviewing me, so I didn't get a chance to really dive into you and your story. Um, share share with our audience kind of how you and I are similar and what that's been like and then some of your findings that you've read. Yeah, so I grew up in a military household. Uh, we moved every two years. I'm the oldest of six kids. Uh, my dad was never home. He was always deployed. He was always in a foreign country, um, you know, doing a lot of things overseas. We lived overseas for a period of time, but when my dad was home, uh, he was an alcoholic. I mean, that's all he did was drink in his downtime. Uh, my mom and him were fighting since as early as I can remember. I mean, it was like a constant argument going on in the house. And my dad, who I don't know necessarily if it was a frustration from um, his relationship with his dad, which was a horrible one. His dad was an alcoholic as well. His mom died at a very early age. uh, And my dad suffered a lot of physical abuse growing up. And his anger would come out in the form of physical abuse with us as well. And me being the oldest of six kids, I was the guinea pig with everything, Mm -hmm. right? So I was the first one to fuck up. I was the first one to talk back you know, and get in trouble and all those things. And so I was really the target for his abuse. Uh, And so when I was, you know, just a kid, probably around six, seven, eight years old, um, the one thing I did take away from my dad was his physical stature, right? Like he was just a, a physical specimen. He was always working out. He was training with the Navy SEALs. He was doing a lot of things that were physical. And then he was beating my ass whenever he was home. Right. And so my thought from like that youthful eight, nine, 10 years old age was, I want to get in physical shape so I can kick my dad's ass, right? Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to be, first of all, I want to stand up for my siblings because I was very protective as well, but also I want to defend myself. And I went from being petrified of my dad to being confident with confronting him probably around age 13, 14, when I started to hit the gym. And uh, the gym became kind of my, my, 
my peaceful place, right? My therapy, my ability to get away from the chaos. My parents finally got a divorce. I say finally because, man, it was a long time coming. Like I was praying for that day uh, when I was about 12 and uh, didn't really see my dad much after that. He was out of the picture. He was still in the military. He was traveling. Um, But when I did see him, our relationship was terrible. You know, it was just constant um, talking down to me, telling me that I was never going to amount to shit. You know, I was just... uh, basically a worthless kid for whatever reason, his anger was directed at me. I don't know if it was just looking back. I'm assuming it was probably because he wasn't hundred percent happy with where his life had gone. Mm-hmm. Um, he had six kids. I mean, beautiful kids, uh, and a beautiful wife and all those things. But I, for whatever reason, it didn't, didn't satisfy him. He wanted something more. So he was out of the picture. Um, and the gym became, you know, my, my safe zone, man. It was, it was my, it was my place of refuge. And so, uh, but growing up without a strong father figure, and meaning in, in my eyes, my father was just someone I was afraid of, someone I didn't want to see, someone I didn't talk to. I didn't have, you know, the birds and the bees talk with my dad. <laughs> you know, I had to figure that shit out on my own. Uh, you know, it really left a huge scar, man. It was something I really didn't address and actually confront until I was in my early 20s. Did you have a lot of animosity towards your parents or him? And Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I Both would, of them or just him? Oh, yeah. I would argue today that I still have some, you know, because I asked my mom, you know, why did you let this shit happen? You know, because, mm. dude, I remember her, <laughs> the main words she always used was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the cops, you know, like I'm going to call the cops this time uh, because of the things he was doing to me. And I remember having bruises all over my legs and arms and, you know, the worst memory I ever had. And this is I'm writing a book right now on fatherhood. But the intro to the book is when I, I remember the, the strongest memory I have of interacting with my dad was him choking me up against the wall because he was mad about something. I came home and I had talked back to my mom and mm. he just picked me up, you know, like out of a fucking Terminator movie and put me up against the wall and was like, you know, swing back, motherfucker. You know, like those are the memories I have. And so, of course, I have animosity. You know, it's like, man, you know, I, I, I feel like my anger that sometimes comes to the surface today is, is a result of having it pent up for so long. With now, them. now looking at you now, you know, you got beautiful kids, uh, beautiful wife, you, you know, successful. Um, you seem very put together. You're definitely somebody who's a, a go-getter. Do you think you succeeded in spite of him or because of him? Oh, dude, that is an awesome question, man. Mm. <laughs> this is this goes back to the conversation I prefer to be the interviewer. Yeah. No, this is that's a great question. And I think about that all the time, actually, because I think it's both, man. I think that as much as he wanted me to either fail or go down his his path and be a clone of his, right? Um, despite that, uh, I I said, no, I'm I'm going to create my own path. I'm gonna forge my own way and figure this thing out for myself. But on the other hand, too, I think because of the experiences I had and because of how much I hated growing up in that environment, it's driven me to search for mentors, for education, for how can I, what's the answer to not Mm. repeating history, right? Because the history of divorce and the history of abuse isn't just on my dad's side. It's my mom's side, too. I mean, the story with her parents is absolutely insane. That's why she stuck around. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Her mom did the same thing with her dad. Mm -hmm. She stuck around despite him stepping out on the marriage all the time, despite him, you know, being fully invested in his business and 0% invested in the marriage. So I just don't want to, I just don't want history to repeat itself. That was my biggest motivation factor when, you know, when I was in my mid twenties and I started to really dig into this stuff because I said, Hey, I, I do want to be happy, right? I do want to have a life that's fulfilling. I want to leave a legacy for my kids. I don't want, I don't want someone little, little Josiah to be on a podcast 20 years from now. Like (laughs) my fucking dad, you know, (laughs) used to choke me and shit. I no, that's not what I want. That, that's something that would keep me up at night. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's become my mission and it just so happens in health and fitness. I mean, it could have been any industry that I, you know, fell in love with, Mm -hmm. but it was fitness for me because of what it did for me as a kid. It's such a, it's such a mind fuck because when you look back at some of these challenging times, it's like, is that why I'm where I'm at now? Is oh, that yeah. why I can talk about and share what I'm sharing now? And if I didn't have that, where would I be? And would I be able to impact, mm-hmm. you know, as many people? Well, you know, when I started uh, becoming a fitness professional, you know, I was a trainer and I never talked about this stuff, dude. Like I never, in fact, it hasn't been until probably the past year and a half that I've started to actually talk about why I got into health and fitness. It was always just me trying to be like every other fitness guy. Let me show my abs. Let me do a photo shoot. Let me, you know, bench press 400 pounds or whatever. That's going to get me 
a bigger business. No, it's not at all. It's my business has exploded by being vulnerable, right? Actually talking about these things and saying, Hey, I'm, I've gone through some shit too, man. Like I know where you're coming from, you know, and that's, that's taken our business to a whole nother level, but it hasn't been easy. It's still kind of scary to talk about this stuff because like you said, with the masculinity thing, like the last thing I want to feel is like, Oh man, I'm not being a man. I'm, I should be hiding this shit. You know, mm-hmm. I shouldn't be talking about all these emotional things. What's, what's your relationship look like with both your parents right now? Uh, there is none with my dad. Um, the last time I interacted with him, uh, it took a bunch of uh, prodding and, and pleading from mentors and friends to reach out to him, right? Say, hey, man, be the bigger man, <laughs> like, you know, and, and reach out to him and say, hey, I want you to be a part of my life now that I have kids. I want my boys, because, dude, truth be told, my dad has some incredible qualities. He's an incredible musician. He can play like three different instrument, instruments. He can build anything. You know, he's built. Uh, partial houses. He's built so many things with his hands, like just from scratch. He has skills, right? I mean, I want my kids to get some of the good things from him, but sure. what ended up happening was, um, and if he's listening to this, <laughs> awesome, but he, uh, I reached out to him on Father's Day, the first Father's Day I ever had, right, as a dad. I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, I know we haven't talked, and at that point it had been like eight years, right? But I was like, I want you know, you to be a part of my son's life because he has one grandfather right now who's awesome on my mom, on my wife's side, but I would like you to be in his life too. And he said, okay, I appreciate that. Why don't you come have dinner with us? So he's remarried now. He's got another wife. Um, and he had us over for dinner and they had this whole thing where they were like, yeah, we're going to be a part of your life now. And like, this is awesome. And it was, it was actually kind of surreal. And uh, after we left, we hadn't heard from him since, man. Like mm-hmm. he just has this thing where he doesn't want Wow. He doesn't want to be a part of our life. We've reached out, I've texted him, no, no. Now, do you think maybe he's ashamed or do you think there's another reason besides, or do you think that's just a character flaw of his? He's just- I, He's a full-blown narcissist, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, meaning, you know, when he was a kid, because I've done my research on this, I, I had to dig to the bottom of like why he's like this. You know, I, I was searching for answers. Now I'm, I'm kind of at peace with it. But uh, I believe as a kid, he was raised in two different environments. One where it was extreme abuse, right? Where his dad was whooping his ass and beating him up and telling him he wasn't worth shit. And then the other environment he was in was with his relatives, his cousins and whatnot, who built him up, let him do anything he wanted. You're king of the world, dude. Like Mm -hmm. you can have it all, right? And so I think his mindset and his uh, outlook on life is that of what he had when he was with his relatives. You know, I'm king of the world. I I don't need to answer anybody. I don't need to do Yeah, why not? If you're going to identify with one or the other, why not pick that one? Yeah, and and truth be told, man, like if you really look at him as a a man, he's a badass. I mean, he can shoot 20 different types of guns. You know, he can do all sorts of crazy shit. But at the end of the day, his relationship with his boys, because he has three of them. I'm one of three Mm -hmm. boys. Um, and three girls, but he, he has no relationship with the boys at all. So it's something with the men. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's, I truly believe it's some kind of pattern that he picked up on from his dad and his interaction with him. Uh, and he just doesn't know how to have a relationship with me. And I I think it is some shame. I do. Now, what about your relationship with all your siblings? Do you, are you guys all really close or are you guys divided? Like what's that look like? No, we're not close. Uh, I'm very close with my youngest brother. I would consider him my best friend. Like he's just everything to me. What's the difference Uh, in age? Nine years, nine years difference. Wow. That's, that's unique that you have that many siblings and you're the closest to the youngest. Mm -hmm. Wow. Why is that? I think it's because um, the the middle siblings really went through the shit, right, with my parents uh, and and I, me included, right. You know, so me and then the three um, right after me went through hell with the divorce. Saw the the worst shit, you know, the worst abuse. My dad hitting my mom, pushing her down the stairs, like crazy stuff, right. And I think we all kind of latched onto our unique, you know, what whatever we could. My 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 sister, who's two years younger than me, she latched onto veganism. Uh, and saving animals. And like, that's just her mission, right? Mm-hmm. She's got a little boy herself. Um, and so she went down that path. And then my, my brother, who's five years younger than me, um, really got into like IT and computer graphic design and all those things. And just totally different than me, right? I was big into sports and working out and all that. And I think we just became these islands because we were so just, I don't know, at the time it was chaotic. And for whatever reason, we kind of separate ourselves from each other. But then the youngest didn't really go through that. They were like, they always kind of saw my parents divorced or separated or whatever. And so they never experienced it. And I think that maybe allowed me to build a relationship with them a little bit better because they didn't have that experience. Right. So it was kind of like just two totally different experiences versus going through shit together and being like, fuck man, that was just horrible and not Mm. wanting to talk about it. You know what I mean? So when you, so when you have your, how old are your kids? They are three and one and a half. Mm. So what are the things now that you try to practice uh, in terms of being a father with them? Patience, man. That's the biggest thing. (laughs) (laughs) That's the hardest thing. So you know what's crazy is actually when I met my wife, 
one of the number one qualities she said that she enjoyed about me was that I'm patient, that I'm just super laid back. Like I'm, I'm easygoing. I'm yeah, let's just do that. I'm cool with that. Whatever. That is not me anymore, dude. Like <laughs> I'm not patient anymore. Like I, I've lost it somewhere along the way. Uh, Having but it's, kids will test you, man. Dude, <laughs> different ways. So that's why I'm writing my book because I'm like, Hey, look, I, you know, it was kind of like fitness, you know, it took me a while to figure out what it meant to be healthy and fit, right? Like, what does it really mean to be healthy and fit? And so that was a struggle. But then when I knew I was going to be a dad, I thought, man, I got this on lock because I know what it's like to be a shitty dad. So I'm just going to do the exact opposite, like, (laughs) you know, without realizing that these kids come out with their own personality their own set of what they think is right and wrong. They have no... And they challenge you yeah, every dude. step of the oh, way. My yeah. son, my three-year-old, we were almost born the same day, which is kind of weird, but we uh, <laughs> we butt heads, dude. Like, like, we're boys, you know what I mean? Like, we're friends, like, fighting it out, dude. Like, it's crazy, but it's his personality, you know? It's like he, he and I are probably extremely similar, at least my wife says we are, mm-hmm. and it's just, it tests me daily. Uh, multiple times a day, often. Three-year-olds in general tend to Oh, be, yeah. I mean, when my daughter was yeah. three... She would throw temper tantrums anywhere. And I, I used to literally joke about like, wow, if I could hook up like an energy machine to you, you could power a city. A city, yes. With the amount like of- evil energy though. And, oh, like- yeah. <laughs> Lex Luthor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like like they're throwing, does your kid throw tantrums where you think to yourself like, is this normal? Should I go to the doctor? Like, is this a, are you possessed? So yeah, yeah. we've been to a therapist, me and my wife. <laughs> no. Oh no. <laughs> because the three-year-old made us feel like there's something like not right. And the therapist was like, dude, this is normal. This, yeah, this is part of the process. <laughs> this is normal, dude. Like, what are you guys, why are you guys here again? You know, you know it was the one of the most, you know, yeah. it's one of the most terrible Terrifying, yeah. one of the most terrifying things I've ever heard in my entire life. So when my daughter would throw these tantrums, she's very, very, very strong-willed. My son was too, but not like my daughter. My daughter's very strong-willed. And she'd throw these tantrums that were just insane. And yeah. so I mm-hmm. did. I called the doctor, who's also was a client of mine, so we were friends. And I'm like, you know, I know I'm a paranoid parent because I used to call her all the time for stupid shit. And I said, but this is... Like she throws herself on the floor. Yeah. And is this normal? And I'm like, she, I feel like she's going to make herself pass out. Like, mm-hmm. and she'd be like, listen, totally normal. Three year olds do this. Don't worry. She goes, and then she said this to me this is nothing. Just wait till she's a teenager. And I just got <laughs> terrified. Ghosted. You hear yeah. that, honey? You sure you want one of these? Yeah, Cause you know, when they're, <laughs> when they're three, you can put them in a room with pillows. You and can be like, pick them up. Yeah. You could be like, here, go crazy. Yeah. When they're teenagers, like I'm leaving. Oh yeah. shit. What do I do what now? No, do? a teenage yeah. woman, she's, she'll have the wit and ability, especially yours. Cause they're going to be smart to like brain ninja you, bro. To uh-huh. say some shit that's just going to like, Oh, crush Sal, you're fucked, fuck, man. Yeah. yeah. I'm just I wish I had a ruined, father that sure. I loved. <laughs> She'll oh. say <laughs> exactly. She's gonna, start, she's gonna say some shit like that. You're like, crying right no, now. No, you can't do that. <laughs> she's, gonna, she's gonna zip, zip one like that to you. That'll when you had two, did you ever think about like maybe a third, or was it just like two is good? So if I were in a marriage that was, uh, you know, not dysfunctional, happy, and you know everything was good, I, pr- you know, looking back, I've always wanted a lot of kids. That's the thing. Now, when I had mine, because of my situation. <laughs> It made me not made me not want to have any more. You know what I mean? Mm. But I did. If you if you asked me before any of that, I grew up in a big family. I like noise. I like kids around. I don't mind necessarily messes and stuff like that. It's not that big of a deal. I enjoy. So I don't know. It's a t- it's tough because now my my uh, my perception on it is skewed because I'm divorced, and of course you know after all that I'm like you know it's like the plague if I think about it, but. I don't know. It's interesting, but I I love man. I love kids. I he's like big so, family. Go slow, ahead and say no. He's slowly changing his Absolutely tune. Just two years not. ago, he was very anti any more children. Oh yeah. 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 Well, two I mean, kids only. A divorce will do that. Divorce. You Two's come out of a manageable. Divorce. After that, it is unmanageable. I, you know what I think? <laughs> it's just math. <laughs> Unless you have an assistant. Here's yeah. what, here's what I think. Oh, pair. I think yeah, exactly. I think the chaos goes gets higher and higher, and then you reach a point where you surrender. Yeah, totally, you, you just give into it. Like, oh, I believe that. that's yeah. That's the point where I am now. I, I've 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 kind of had like an awakening. I'm like, dude, is your I'm, house just a fucking mess with toys and shit everywhere? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, we I, I have a maid now that comes every like couple of weeks because otherwise it would be like fucking Walking Dead. Oh, you have to, yeah, It'd be like p- spray paint on the walls and shit. Like what the <laughs> f- music just blasting and all you hear is kids screaming. Oh, and like, puppy. So my so we there's four in my family. So it was four of us. I remember I remember literally thinking this. Literally thinking sometimes like. Because my mom would be the one that would be with us most of the time. And I remember thinking, like, 
Is my mom like, why does she lose her mind all the time? Like, yeah. you do that. I used to tell my mom. Oh, now you I used to actually sit my mom down. Here I am. I'm like 10, right? Because I've always been like older than my age. And I'd sit down with her and I'd be like, listen, mom. And this would piss her off. I'd be like, you need to learn how to relax. Like, you're way too. <laughs> that still pisses women off. Dude. Oh, yeah. I'd be like, you're way too stressed out. Like, yeah. you don't need to yell Chill. so much. You don't need to. And then she would just get so crazy. But now that I have kids, I look, I, I've done so many times I called my mom and I'm like, hey, mom, I apologize for those conversations. I could see why. Dude, I had the. It's just. I'm, I'm like, uh, really really just shocked at myself because I, I go through these phases where I'm like dude I, I want to like adopt one of these kids out right because there's so much chaos at least it seems like it <laughs> you want to rent them out to people yeah and then five minutes after I leave the house I'm like in tears because I miss them so much you know like it's it's crazy and then I tell my my wife and I are both in agreement that we think two is good right like mm. we're happy but then we both had these moments and it's almost like biologically my my brain is telling me to reproduce again because I see like these little mm. kids are you know younger than mine now you know mine's youngest a year and a half and I'm flying here to San Jose and I'm sitting next to this little cutest little girl ever and she's like a year old and she's so well behaved and I'm like damn like I'd love to have a little girl like, that. <laughs> like you know what if I, mean? I try one more time yeah. maybe I'll get one like this <laughs> <laughs> I'll get roll, a good one roll yeah, the yeah, dice exactly maybe the third one's a charm it's like our biological instinct what is about like, you Justin have you ever had those seed. thoughts never <laughs> <laughs> I am rock solid on two dude. yeah yeah I would have a panic attack if like you know I got a call and I had to, I was driving home. Like I actually thought about this. <laughs> but I'm like, you played this scenario out. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, there's been a few scares, but you know what? Like whatever, dude. You never planned for it. I would roll with it. It's just how it goes. So yeah, that's just kids in general. You're considering though getting uh, snipped, right? Isn't that what you're mm -hmm. planning on doing? Me too. Absolutely. Brother. We dude. can do it together, man. Let's just go now. Yeah. Like a snipping party. <laughs> I kind of need you know some moral support. Oh, so pff, I'm scared shitless, man. Yeah. You know if you get you know when you get a vasectomy, my balls. It, it, uh, it may actually reduce these the the amount of semen that you produce you actually may reduce seminal volume Good. no more no more porn uh, uh whatever you so call it's it. like yeah. when Finishing. you when you finish it's just yeah, yeah. Just air. Just air. How <laughs> sad oh, is that's that? depressing it's just clear liquid dude. oh man it's like nothing really it? Isn't it? just no. water no <laughs> it just drips out it's just like bloop, bloop, bloop. Is that, wasn't that just <laughs> But isn't that sad? Yeah, There's no color be. to it anymore. You know what? I would be a little bit. It kind of ruined things a little bit. Yeah. Of course. That would yeah. be like, that's half of the orgasm is that how hard and how much oh, that yeah, comes yeah, out. Yeah. Oh, you want that? I like, like a, to measure like how far hard did I shoot. Yeah, if it dribbles out, I'm like, well, that was a really good fantasy. Ceiling. That was yeah. obviously like, yeah. obviously I'm not into the teacher thing. I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Wonder Woman gets me to the ceiling. That's, that's, how, I me that's how I measure fantasies. I was like, well, that wasn't fucking as cool as I thought it was. Oh, wow. Look, babe, I shot 15 inches. Don't take a blue light in my bedroom. Man, it's fucking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you paint here with a bunch of <laughs> bunch of fluorescent? Did you drew your name on the wall. What yeah. the hell? <laughs> no, man. But a little girl, you know, little girls will just fucking melt you. Yeah, melt yeah. you totally differently. Not better, not worse. It's just it is what it is, man. It's just yeah. a little different. That's what uh, everybody says. My all my best friends have all girls. It's like mm. two or three girls each one of them, and they all tell me the same thing. Like it totally changes you, man. I'm like, yeah. oh, dude. I'm with, I got my two boys though, my two little monkeys. Yeah. So. <laughs> Good deal. Now, how do you manage it right now with the, the traveling and getting on shows and doing right. all that? Like, does your wife work or? She does. Yeah, she actually has her own business too. Um, she uh, is in, in the beauty industry. Uh, she still cuts hair oh, part time. Right. She managed. She was like high up on a very uh, big corporate um, hair chain, I guess. Uh, when I met her, mm -hmm. and her career was super cuts. Oh yeah, right. No, was, <laughs> some some East Coast company, it's more um, fancy. Yeah, uh, Bubbles, I guess was was who she was working for. But yeah, so uh, she was. I know her, that guy. Her career path was just skyrocketing when we met, and then she got pregnant. Horrible pregnancy, like super sick. You know, fucking dead to the world the whole time, and uh, so her career kind of got put on pause. She became a full time mom for a period of time for about two years. I was starting a business kind of on the tail end of that. And uh, when we had our second one, she felt decent enough to go back to work. So she missed it, right? She was like, I miss you know, my clients. I miss cutting hair. I miss doing that stuff. But she just was like, I can only handle part-time. So she's been part-time um, since we had our second one. But then she recently, over the past year, started her own um, like eyelash extension business. Mm -hmm. So she does that That's full big time. business, by the way. Yeah, dude. She's killing it, man. She's booked. Nice. You know, she's over oversubscribed or whatever for, uh, for like months. Um, so she's doing that. But dude, managing it all is like another thing I'm passionate about because it's really tough, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when you have two kids and you guys know, and when you're trying to build a business, and Justin, I think we talked about this when you came on my <laughs> show, but- yeah. It's it's one of the things that people don't see enough of, right? The behind the scenes, mm -hmm. right? 
everybody thinks it's all rainbows and fucking Instagram filters and shit. It's not right. It's, it's a lot of sacrifice. I mean, for me to get to the next level, whether it's even something is you know, coming out and seeing you guys taking a flight and being gone for two days, uh, takes a, a team a effort. Yeah. yeah. It takes a huge team effort. So with two little kids, obviously they're not independent. They can't do anything by themselves. Um, so my wife, God bless her. She takes on a lot of the responsibility, right? She lets me do what I need to do, whether it's recording podcasts, whether it's business for the fitness side of things. Um, and so she respects important. that. Yeah. So important. I, I mean, without my wife, I mean, obviously she's just I as was, responsible for your success as you are. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, dude, it's a hundred percent. I mean, there's no, nobody's, and you know, initially it was a struggle because obviously you get thrown into the the new path of being a parent. You're like, man, I'm fucking doing more than you, and she's like, mm. no, I'm doing more than you, and it's like that initial struggle. Right. But then you realize, man, we're both just out here trying to do the same thing. Like, yeah. take care of our kids, provide for the family. Um, but it does take a lot of planning. I mean, I think anybody who's a aspiring entrepreneur or who has kids and is like, man, maybe I should have a side hustle or something like that. I would say the biggest mistake I made was just not being really well planned out. Like just, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great to take action, you know, aim, fire, shoot, whatever the fucking thing is, just take action. But you also, if you have a lot going on and responsibilities with family, you need to plan it, man. That's, you know, I sit down, I spend a lot more time, I would say planning now than anything else, like just mapping it out. Efficiency is everything. Efficiency. Yeah, Yeah. You have to get to that place and it unfortunately does come with schedule. Yeah. And which is something I used to like never do. And I was just like, I would just stay at work. You know, I'm just going to stay here all day because eventually I'll get stuff done. Yep. But you really have to like manage your time effectively and, you know, use that to your own advantage because you don't have that excess time to, to burn. So no, it makes you better. I think, I think Absolutely. it can make you better or it can make you fail, but yeah. you, if, but it makes you better because you have to be. Mm. One thing that I learned, uh, is just to make peace with, uh, what is, and what I mean by that is, when you're in this you know, state of planning and chaos and the kids and work and I'm traveling and all this other stuff, you can either hate it or you can make friends with it. You're in it anyway. And so a mind game that I'll play with myself is I'll say, okay, what if this is how it's always going to be? What if it'll never change? What if it never gets to the point where you know, I can make this much so I only have to work this much? Or what if it's always like this? Let me pretend like that. Let me just imagine that and make peace with it. And it makes things a lot easier versus being in it and like fighting it. Like, oh, this is, I'm too busy. This can't happen. I'm traveling too much. I can't, because then it just, you're, you're making a nightmare of what the reality is, which you can't change. Now, anyway. Josiah, did you, yeah. you said uh, that there was a time where she, when she first got pregnant that, and her career was kind of booming and taking off. She had to back off of that and the, obviously come home, raise the kid. You were also at the same time trying to k- launch something. Did that put a lot of stress on the relationship? And was there any animosity from her with with you with having to leave that for you to pursue your dream? 100%, dude. Yeah, 100%. Um, coming from generations, multiple generations of divorce, another thing that keeps me up at night or, or did keep me up at night was the potential of divorce. Um, it happens more than it doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. In today's, especially Western culture. Now, she is um, 100% Afghan. So her, her ancestry is 100% from Afghanistan. And she lived in Germany up until she was 15. And then, so she came to the United States when, when she was 15 and she's been here ever since. So she's been here for about a decade and a half. Um, but yeah, her side of family is much more uh, about marriage, about loyalty. Right. And so there's no, like, there's no divorce, right? It's like, Hey dude, you're fucking married. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, you miserable, enjoy it. You're going to be married. Right. (laughs) And so from her perspective, um, yes, there was animosity and there was struggle and man, we've, fucking fought a lot. Right. And we went from not fighting at all to fighting a lot. And so there were moments where I was like, damn dude, like, here we go. This is what happens. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, now I know why people get divorced. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I would say, you know, we're fortunate, right. To where, uh, we do compliment each other. And I think at the end of what feels like world war three with some of these fights, um, there is learning from that, right. There is saying, Hey, we fucked up, right? Like I fucked up or she says I fucked up and we do, we do come together and we build from that. But it, dude, it's far from easy, man. Like I, I laugh. We joke around all the time about some of the, the Instagram or social media couples that we see who it's all like <laughs> <laughs> holding each other up over, you know, the yeah. balcony and ocean and shit. And it's like, dude, it's not like that, man. I mean, if we could paint a real picture of what it's like, we, you know, we would. And it's like, hey, sometimes it's just shitty, man. And you just got to, like you said, I love what you just said, by the way, that, that like hit home for me. <laughs> if it was always like this, you know, am I going to be okay? You know, and it's, that's a great exercise because that's the truth. Like that's really how, how you have to look at it. What did you, what did you learn about yourself during that process? You know, what is, I mean, it sounds like, especially a man who went through 
loud fighting, things like that. I know how I react in those situations. I'm probably a little bit different than the average person when they get put in that. What did you learn about yourself when you went through that? Well, I'm a huge introvert, right? So I, I enjoy silence. I enjoy being But you don't come myself. off that way, by the way. Yeah, it's, it takes practice. You know, I if I have my way, I'd be, you know, like the laptop warrior. I'd be on my computer doing work from some remote location by myself listening to you guys or Joe Rogan or some shit. You know, like that, that's like my perfect day. Um, but with my wife, she's the opposite. She thrives off of interaction and, and talking it out. And so initially I realized, damn, like, uh, and I don't know if you guys have read the five love languages. Yeah, if, we've if you read that about book. It. Mm-hmm. So what I learned the most was what my what my wife responds really well to, mm. you know, and what I respond well to. So like words of affirmation for me is fucking huge, dude. Like if my wife tells me, dude, you, you know, I listened to your podcast. It was so awesome. Oh my god! Like I feel like I just like came. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yes, you know, I'm coming, like, I'm coming, got your yeah. attention exactly. But with my wife, it's it's uh, affection. Like that's the big thing. And then also doing uh, acts of whatever it's called, acts of uh, I don't know what it kindness, is, kindness, acts of kindness. Yeah, doing things and also um, just chores, man. Just doing things around the house. My wife, like it's like her birthday. You know, if I do the dishes yeah. mm-hmm. and so. Through all that, you know, we were fortunate. Um, me being pl- so plugged into learning and all that thing, all those like books and whatnot, um, I read that book and she did too. And that was an eye opening experience for us. We realized we were trying to communicate with each other the opposite of what we respond to. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, hey, like, you know, me telling you you do a great job, babe, at work for her was not doing shit. You know, mm-hmm. she's like, dude, I don't need to hear that I'm a great mom. Like, mm-hmm. that's not doing it for me. I, I need I you to ask. take the trash out, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And for me, it was like, babe, I just need you to tell me that, like, you saw my Instagram post and it was really cool. You know, and that was it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's all I needed. And so we started to work on that. Um, and it's just been, you know, I think a commitment to understanding that we know very little. Right. And that we need to continue to keep our minds open about what marriage really is about um, and to work together and communicate a ton, man. Like we need to be talking all the time about what's working, what's not, you know, reassessing. Like, are we doing the right things? I watched this interesting video on YouTube. It was a really fascinating one. I hope I can find it because I know people are going to ask me uh, what the which video it was. But there was a I think it was a sociologist who was talking about marriage and its, and its role and how it's changed and some of the factors that have contributed to the dissolution of it, or at least the de- destruction of, the, uh, of, of marriage. Because you, you're right, the statistics now show an incredibly high uh, divorce rate. It's, uh, it's, if by, for all intents and purposes, it's falling apart. And what they said was, and it was a woman, what she said was that uh, marriages used to mean uh, a partnership. Like, we're partners. I do my thing, you do your thing. We're partners, we're raising a family. That was the priority. Right. And then it started to change where it became, I'm marrying you because you fulfill me and you're marrying me because I fulfill you. And she said, the reason why this is a problem is the expectation. nobody yeah. can fulfill you but yourself. Yeah. Yep. And marriage is a partnership, especially when you have children. And so I watched this video, it fucking blew my mind because it's like, you know, when you're with your spouse, if you guys understand that your partner's first, like, okay, we got to work together yeah. to get this family to succeed. So we're that we're a team. Yeah. And no job is less important than the other. We're doing this together. Like we're part of the same team. And then the second part is if I feel unfulfilled, I need to be able to fulfill myself on my own because that's a good practice anyway. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't have to or not only should you not, but if you depend on someone else to fulfill you, that's codependency and that that's dysfunctional. And so I, the video just blew my mind because I, I think a lot of, not all, because of course there's a lot of shit that goes down, but I think a lot of the divorces from people being like, I'm unfulfilled with this, so yep, I'm just yeah. going to leave. And it's like, you could go and have your own life and fulfill yourself and also work on your partnership at the same time. I think too, understanding that people do change, man. Like, you know, my wife isn't the same person uh, she is today as when I met her, right? I mean, things have changed. Which is uh, good. It's is a good thing. Yeah, yeah you wouldn't want absolutely. to be the same person. Yeah, yeah when evolution. you actually think about it, like, holy shit, I don't want to be the same person I was, you know? So why would I expect, you know, any different from my wife? Right. Uh, you have to, you have to appreciate that, you know, because you know, I look at it as now to, I get to experience a lifetime of, of evolution with this person, right? Like who is she going to become? I'm excited to see who she becomes and vice versa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the partnership is is exactly what it is. And it's, you know, it's, it's an intimate partnership, but it's one that, you know, like when, when you look at, okay, here's what I do, here's what she does. And you start comparing and saying, well, I should get, you know, bonus points for doing this shit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she should get negative points because she said that. Like you can't keep score, man. Like no. keeping score is like the worst 
thing. And I did it initially because it's just like I'm like, you know, I'm new to this. I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. You, know, you guys have been yeah. together for a, a long time now. Yeah. Have you have you put together or found some relationship hacks that yeah. help keep you guys really connected? So this will be a good one for business owners. Um, and you guys can probably relate. But what we do now, because with kids, it's almost impossible to get date nights um, when we want one, right? Because like a Friday night, you know, a lot of the young babysitters, they're like out doing their own thing. And her parents, they like to go out and they live down the road from us. So they're, they're there for us when, you know, when we need them, but we don't want to abuse that. Right. So what we started doing is these day dates, um, which is we just cut out of work completely. You know, it could be a random day, a Wednesday, whatever. And we say, Hey, we're going to set up babysitting for, you know, that night. And we're going to spend from early morning when we drop the kids off at daycare to, however long we want to stay out together. Day drinking is the best. Yeah. And and really just, you know, instead of like the typical, um, you know, night, night date or whatever, where you have to wake up early, take care of the kids the next day. It's like, Hey, let's set aside the things that we put so much effort into, which is work and career and building a business and turn off social media, no phone, you know, unless someone needs us to get a hold of us for the kids and just go do something together for an entire day. That's fucking brilliant. Dude, that's what we do, man. Actually brilliant. Save my fucking marriage. I'm not going to lie to you because we were reaching a point with two kids under the age of two mm-hmm. at the time, right? Because my son was a year and a half when my youngest was born. We were like, dude, we get no time with each other. Mm-hmm. Like, it's scary. You start looking at, when was the last time I had sex? It's like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. fuck, I don't know. <laughs> like, that's not a good thing, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the things we enjoyed doing together when we first met, uh, most of what we realized was just like daytime stuff, like simple stuff. Go grab lunch, like go to the movies, mm-hmm. um, you know, go walk around somewhere, go hiking. Uh, and so we started to do that and we just schedule that now once a month, at least we have a day date, no work, no phones, go do something. We plan it ahead of time and we just knock out something we want to do, man. It's, it's yeah. life changing for me. That's be doing that. I mean, we, we have sort of planned, um, a way that like, I don't want her to always identify as mommy, you mm-hmm. know? And so for me, like to get her time to hang out with her friends and then come back is been like game changer as well. So that mm-hmm. way she feels like, you know, like when you could just let your hair down, be yourself and like kind of revisit like who you are and then come back and then she, it like fills her up. Do you tell her, Justin, do you go to your wife and say, Hey, listen, Friday, I'm going to watch the kids. Yes. I want you to go out and do your yeah. thing. Oh, that's gotta be amazing. Yeah, I'll that's do awesome. that. And then I'll do that every now and then she'll go to like Cabo with her girlfriends or whatever. And I'm just like, yeah, dude, take, yeah. you know, four days or whatever. I'll handle it. Sometimes I'll do it, but it's not like you do this. Then I do that. You know, I'm just like, I know it just benefits our relationship doing mm. that. Yeah, you have to invest in, in your spouse. You know, I think uh, and I think you have to do it without any expectations in return. You know, that was the big game changer for me. You mm-hmm. know, oh, yeah, babe, I'll go watch the kids. You know, you go get a massage. In my mind, though, thinking, well, I fucking better get a guy's night for this shit. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. not going to work because right. she may not be. And this is kind of like you said, you have to understand that your individual thought process and her perception and all those things might not match. Right. So mm-hmm. if I say, hey, go on a girl's weekend trip with the expectation that when you get back, you're going to jump into mommy mode and let me go do my thing for three days. Yeah. That might not work out like it's that. Us, it's actually a self, although it sounds logical, it's a self-defeating uh, way of thinking because the reality is if you're truly partners, you live together and you have two kids together, whatever, that, that if that partner of yours is more calm, if they've got, you know, if they feel better about what they're doing, if they feel like they were able to spend some time away and now they really want to be there to do what they were doing with the kids, that benefits you also. Yeah. So it's so it's a self-defeating thought process to think, oh, when you get back, I'm going to do my thing and we're going to do tit for tat because it, 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 in reality, it benefits both of you uh, either way. Like if, I, if I'm stressed out and, you know, if, if my girl says, go relax, man, you're really stressed, you've been working a lot and I come back, she's going to benefit from it too and vice totally. versa, yep. you know? So it's really, you have to look at it that way. Otherwise it becomes this, it's, you know, this whole like we got to be equal on everything yeah. uh, mentality um, has really gotten distorted mm. with couples where they start to do that, where I spend this They're much money, you spend this much up. money. Yeah. I earn this much money, you earn this much money. I do this task, you do this task. Never, never in a million years will it work that way. No no business, no successful business has ever run that way. No successful partnership has ever worked that way. Yeah. Nothing's ever worked well that way. And I would encourage anybody too who's listening, I mean, who's going through this stuff, is this is not something that comes naturally to us, right? This takes a lot of work and it does take a lot of practice. Like you have to be very self-aware, you know, am I setting expectations? Am I, you know, even subconsciously, am I like expecting something in return for this? Am I investing in this, hoping to get a positive return on my investment, right? It, it, the partnership uh, relationship is is one that is selfless, right? You need to think of it as, hey, it's not her responsibility for me to be happy. 
you know, I need to take the bull by the horns and commit to happiness, or I need to take the bull by the horns. If I need something, I need to communicate, right? Uh, I can't just expect her to read my mind uh, or, or reciprocate and say, hey, yeah, you gave me a massage. Now I'm going to give you a massage. Like, that's not how it works, dude. Like, and as soon as you work on that and actively map that out and say, hey, this is what I'm really going to focus on. Like, I, I have it in my phone as a reminder. I have like, hey, this is how many times I want to hang out with my wife this year. Like, and it's only because I want to get better at it, you know? Yeah. And it's not about Smart. being robotic and shit. It's just yeah. like, I just really want to measure this stuff it's what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed right mm. so you have to do that what do you That's think really you important. what do you think you suck at like as far as in the relationship what do you always feel like is your achilles heel or you're always uh yep no this is an easy one for me because uh growing up and you might be able to relate dude but uh i felt like i was an island right so i i felt very secluded very on my own i felt like my parents were fucking nuts and like they're not from here like i'm the normal one right and they don't know what they're talking about and so i would hide a lot of shit from them because i wouldn't want them to give me their opinions on it i wouldn't want them to get jumped down my throat i wouldn't want my dad to freak out and so i've developed this habit of not telling everything. That's not lying. It's just not telling everything, right? Like maybe just not sharing a success story or maybe not sharing sure. something that no I did. No malintent. Yeah, no malintent at all. It's just, I'm so used to keeping it inside, right? I'm so used to harboring my feelings or my emotions or my successes or failures. And so uh, my wife is the opposite. She loves to share everything. Like she's just all about just expressing what's going on. And I suck at that, dude. I'm the worst. And so like, it's, it's really awkward. Like when she finds out something that maybe good or bad happened and you didn't tell her, you know, and she's like, dude, what the fuck? You know what I mean? I thought we were partners. Like, what's going yeah. on? And I'm like, ooh, damn, I does suck. She, does, <laughs> she, does she take it personal sometimes? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, but once again, you know, it, it comes down to her understanding too that, hey, Josiah's not perfect, right? Josiah's, he needs to work on this. And it's my decision to be there to help him to help work with him on this. What do I got to do to help him? And it's my responsibility to own up to it. Like, mm. dude, yeah, I fucking suck, man. My bad, you know, and get better next time. I mm. think I'm, I have the same thing too. Only I, I believe my girl struggles with the same thing too. So we're, mm. we understand that part of each other. I feel other. like yeah. your girl's kind of psychic though, Adam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she does have she some, does she does have some power. That's why you're so good at gambling. Yeah, yeah. she's yeah. got some wicked. <laughs> I wish she would help me with that shit. Right? She, all she needs is a little sage. Use that black yeah. magic for yeah. some good, yeah. God damn it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I struggle with the same. But part of mine, too, I think is a little, maybe you're like this, too, because I can, I can totally relate to the harboring feelings and keeping stuff inside. But some of mine is just I'm fucking scatterbrained. Like, there's so many things that happen in a day that sometimes I'd literally forget. Like, <laughs> yeah. for me to recall, like, all these different <laughs> phone conversations or interactions that I had with people and then to tell that story, mm. you know, I'm an totally. open, I'm an open book. If she asks me or she brings it up, I'll tell her whatever she wants to hear. But you're right. There's sometimes she'll hear it on the podcast and then she'll get mad at me because she'll be like, how come you didn't tell me that story that happened to you last week? And I'm like, well, I just I, tell her like, I know you listen to the show. So yeah, that's why well, I do that. That's why I, I pawn it off. Dude, right? one, one thing for me that I, I kind of figured out about myself was that, you know, since I, I'm technically an introvert, right. And all day long I'm interacting with people, whether it's business, clients, mm. uh, coaching, whatever, right. So My where's team you out, where's you the fuck out. Yeah. So you get home, mm -hmm. guess what I want to do? Yeah. Nothing. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you don't guess what talk. I don't want to do? Yeah. Talk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So like, it's not I that I don't want to share shit, but yeah. it's like, dude, I just exhausted all the, you know, personality that I have for the day. I'm done. Yeah. You know, I'm so. turning off. So yeah. I, I got a good question then for, for someone who is, you know, self-aware enough to know that you tend to want to keep things inside and not necessarily share them. And now you're literally part of your, your living or your job is to share mm -hmm. and talk about things. How has it, accelerated your growth as an individual? Has it brought more awareness? Has it been like, what are the challenges and what are the, the awesome things about it? Yeah, it's definitely accelerated my awareness um, about who I am. Um, and also it's accelerated my awareness about what people respond to. Uh, because when you start sharing things and you start talking about, you know, your, what you consider to be your deepest, darkest secrets or fears and whatnot, uh, you know, you start to get some hate, you start to get some, you know, a tribe that starts building around that, which is pretty crazy. Uh, people start to really relate and they start opening up to you and just sharing things that you're like, Whoa, dude, like, that's crazy. Like I, you know, I wasn't expecting that you start impacting people on a real level. I mean, people have told me that, uh, because of our programs and our coaching, we've literally saved their life, saved their marriage, saved their kids. I mean, and you start thinking, damn, like, you know, m maybe the secret, and I don't know, you posted something about utopia or something today, mm -hmm, I believe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is just about, you know, how can I be just a human, right? How can I share the things that I go through uh, and just be a damn human being, right? And open up about these struggles. Because truthfully, I mean, a lot of us have these things. 
but for me personally, I mean, it's, it hasn't been easy. It's, it's taking continuous practice. I still have to really take a look at like, what am I putting out there? Is this valuable? Am I actually helping someone or am I just giving kind of the, the standard health and fitness stuff? Um, or am I going deeper, right? Am I taking it down further into different levels where we're actually uncovering why people need these things, why people are driven to do certain things, why I'm, I'm driven and share the struggle, share the experiences, share the victories so that uh, we impact people, not just on a surface level, but on a deep uh, mental level as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I think the big eye opening experience for me was when I did open up I, and I was speaking in front of guys, you know, 200 men, all mostly older than me with kids. Um, and I was sharing my experiences, how many tears I saw in the crowd, dude, like, I was like, dude, a lot of people deal with this, you know, it's not just me, you know, it's not, I'm not the only one who thinks, damn, I had a shitty dad, how am I going to be a good dad, you know, how am I going to run a business, I never learned how to do this, you know, how am I going to be a good husband, I never learned how to do that, and you got all these people um, out there who are like, yeah, dude, like, I feel that way too, uh, and it's just, takes the courage to open up and it and does. It. It, it was a talk that I watched by uh, Jordan Peterson. It's uh, you, you actually talked about one of the quotes that uh, I kind of referenced in, in that post that I did, but what he was saying, he was saying, he was talking about how difficult it is for people to take care of themselves as if they were taking care of someone that they loved. And he thought to himself, why is that so difficult? Well, when you really think about it, it's obvious. Nobody knows you as well as you do. And you know all the bad shit you've done. Everything. Every little thought, every little selfish thing, every little... And all of us are fucking terrible people if we really narrow it down and think about that. <laughs> we all, If you add that all up, yeah. you how can you love yourself? I know when I'm lazy. I know when I'm mm -hmm. narcissistic. I know when I say things to hurt someone. I know when I've stolen or when I've hurt somebody or whatever. I know every single little intricate detail about myself. But when I look at other people, I don't know those things. In fact, for the most part... What I know, and because that's all people want to show you, is the good stuff. And so when I, I compare like when I compare that to the other people, it's going to be impossible for me to love myself. And the reason why you saw tears in the crowd <laughs> is because you're sitting here spilling it out. Every person in that crowd is crying, maybe partially because they're empathetic to you, but partially, I think, because they're empathetic to themselves. Totally. And they're like, holy fuck, I'm not alone, right. and wow, I need to be able to forgive myself and whatever. Mm. And... You know, it's funny because talking on a podcast when you, I think when you when you're on a podcast, at least this happens for me, and I don't know, maybe you can echo this, Josiah. But when I'm on a podcast, because I feel like it's a higher purpose, like I'm trying to help others with what I'm saying, I'm way more open and honest. Yes. Than I am. In, in, I'm surprised sometimes the things I say. I'm like, oh my god, they fucking say that. <laughs> yeah. Can you guys edit this shit out? Yeah. No, but like, it, you're right because when you when you when you're doing it, like I said in the beginning, it, it was a labor of love. It was because. I wanted to, you know, selfishly, obviously hear from really intelligent people, things that could expand my knowledge base, but also have a platform for others to learn and to hear these experiences so they could get help uh, with, well, you know, health and fitness obviously being the number one thing, but other things that lead, you know, down crazy roads with all sorts of um, things that we all struggle with. Mm. Um, but yeah, dude, I mean, yeah, the talk about you know, the Jordan Peterson factor with helping others, um, you know, I, I still come back to the whole idea that it really does take practice, right? You really need to think about like, hey, why, you know, why am I not doing this or how can I be better and, and just measure it because it's not something that comes naturally to a lot of us, man. No. Who's been your like favorite or most impactful guest so far? Have you had anybody on your show so far where you're just like you left the interview or the conversation? Yeah. Uh, actually, it hasn't released yet, but it should be out this week. Um, this guy named Anthony Trucks. I don't know if you guys who know who Anthony Trucks is, a former NFL player, hmm. um, but he was actually an orphan. Uh, him and his, I believe it was three siblings, uh, were in foster care up until he was about 15, uh, but not your, you know, nice foster care. I mean, these these kids went through uh, hell. I was in tears listening to his story because I, I was like, man, you know, just when you think you had it rough, it's like you hear some of these stories, dude, mm -hmm. and you're, you know, like uh, one that he shared with me and you hear on the show, but you know, these these people, these monsters who had them in their custody. Uh, would put them in shopping carts and push them down hills, just watch them fall out and laugh. These little kids, you know, like, wow. and, and the hell? I'm like, dude, it, it got me angry, you know, it got me sad and all these emotions. But his story and dude, where he is now is incredible. Like his positivity is just mind blowing. Like he's such a good dude. I, and I've known him now for a little while, uh, but it was just eye opening because he's a, he's a father now. He's a, a husband, successful business guy. He's been in the NFL. 
He's owned multiple businesses and uh, just his early childhood experience with no parents at all uh, and then finding a way out and having success, man. It was just, it was incredible, man. You, you know what I'd like for you to share a little bit about because recently I've done a few interviews or been interviewed on some shows where guys are a little bit younger and getting into the podcast world, getting into this social media business world. And I feel like there's... Um, there's a there's a misconception right now of what that looks like, and I, I feel like we've met a lot of people that we've interviewed that don't have this. They don't have millions of followers on Instagram. They don't have millions of followers on YouTube. They, in fact, their network looks pretty small, but have a very successful business. And then I've met the flip of that a lot, which is guys and girls that have a million followers or hundreds of thousands of people in their network, and they don't make very much money at all. Shed some light on your experience with that and what you see and uh, what it's been like for you. Yeah, man. I think uh, initially uh, when I got into social media, my wife will tell you a hilarious story, right? Like when she met me, um, she knew what Instagram was all about but I had no fucking clue. Like she used to make fun of me. Like, why are you, what are you doing, dude? Like you want to make money off Instagram? Like you need to chill out. Like you're not doing anything right. And so, uh, over the past like year and a half with social media, obviously there's been this whole desire from, you know, and everybody kind of shares this. You see what people get marketed to. And you know, these business uh, gurus who are talking about, Hey, I'm going to help grow your Instagram to a hundred thousand followers, or I'm going to show you how to make six figures in 30 days and all this stuff. Um, anytime you're you're running a business that is uh, service based, right? Um, you have to understand that it's each individual person that comes through your virtual doors um, is really important, right? Like you have to put the people and the customers or the potential customers um, as your number one priority, right? Um, assuming you have business system that makes sense, assuming you have operations that can handle you know uh, customers and you know how to operate a, a business. Every person that comes to the door, whether you have 10 followers or 10 million followers, um, it's super important. So we, from the beginning, put an emphasis on every person we interact with, we want them to walk away from that experience being wowed, right? Like, hey, Josiah, he gives a shit about me, right? Like, he answers my questions. He's there. He's the man or his team, whoever is representing my company, um, gives an experience that is unfor- unforgettable, right? And so I stopped giving a shit about how many followers I have. I mean, I, I just closed down an Instagram account that had like almost 20,000 followers and I started a new one because I wasn't happy with the direction that account was going. I wanted mine to be very personal and very interactive and it just wasn't that with that account. So I shut down that old account and I said, I'm going to start a new because I really want my account. I don't care if I have 2000 followers initially or if I never get to any amount of followers and I just have 500 people. As long as each person who interacts with my page or my business and any facet feels like we actually give a shit, right? right? We actually are trying to help you because we are. Like we actually are. And that's the thing. I think um, because the metric of number of followers is so clear and obvious when you yep. turn on Instagram that people think that that is the metric, that, that that is the most important one. How many total followers you have, that's going to dictate your success. It's not, in fact, uh, you talk about having an account with 500 followers. You know how many businesses would die for 500 customers? Right. And so really it's not about the number, it's about the connection you make you know, with these people. We know, I mean, I, look I, at can, like I could list several pages yeah. that are in the hundreds of, hundreds of thousands and they don't do anything. There's a lot of pretenders. Of I mean, there's a lot of uh, business people or people who just don't know how to operate a business who are great with social, right? They know how to market themselves or they know how, you know, the angles to take and all that cool stuff. They just don't know how to take, you know, uh, an in- interested person into a customer. They don't know that journey, how that works, right? How to build trust. I think that's more common than not. Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, look around. If it wasn't, we'd all be like, damn, look who's driving that Lambo. Look who's driving. I mean, it's just yeah. not common, right? I think it's more common than anything else to be self-absorbed because it's just natural uh, human inclination to say, hey, like, I care about me. I, I I care about what I'd like to see, right? Like I want to post a picture that I think is cool uh, versus like, you know, we're, we're big uh, on planning around YouTube right now because we see accounts like you guys who have success and we're like, what do people really want to see, right? Do they want to see me changing fucking diapers and driving my kids to school and vlogging? Maybe the younger generation associates vlogging with something they want to see. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, people just want something they can take away, right? And actually utilize. They want something that's actionable, that helps them, that goes, oh, light bulb goes off. That's how you do that, right? So I think if you put an emphasis on how can I help um, versus what I think is cool, right. then you're going to be light years ahead of the competition. Now, 
I, I'd be lying if I didn't say I would love to have a million followers on Instagram or whatever, sure. right? I mean, I have a lot on Facebook. You know, I think we're nearing 20,000 likes or something on my page, which is okay. But that doesn't mean I'm going to be successful in business. The habits that you need to have when you have no followers, you know, when you have five, 10, I think, I don't even know what we have now. It's like 1,300 or something on the new page. But the habits you have when you have low followers and the, and the integrity that you mm-hmm. have, that's going to dictate what happens when you do grow. Because we'll eventually be huge. I know that. But I'd like our team to have extremely good habits now to where every person, whether we have 10 or 100,000, goes, dude, True Transformation, Josiah, his team, they get it, man. They're so awesome. Mm-hmm. They take care of me. Well, I think of it even even differently. Like you said, how figure out how to help people. I think of it in terms of, and it's the same thing. I just use different verbiage. It's uh, uh, your value. What kind of value yeah. do I bring to the marketplace? If my value is my images, is my pictures, then the price people will pay for that value is to simply follow me, which gets me nothing. It gets me zero. I make nothing off of that. If my value is my content, what I can produce, my advice, my whatever, now the market value increases because it costs more to get that. So if I'm making that connection with people and people are following me, not for my images, and I'm not saying images don't matter because images do matter, but that's not why they follow you. They now, they, they, the market value that is much higher. If I want someone to assist me with my whatever fat loss, I know that's going to cost a certain amount. If I just want to look at someone's pictures, social media has brought the market value of that down to zero to the point where you used to have to buy a magazine for that. Now you don't. It's free. So if that's all you're focusing on, you're going to work for free. You can get a large following, but you have no market value. So it's going to be free. Yeah, you're going to win the popularity contest. But you know the bank account or whatever you're trying to do as far as your legacy or your you know financial security or whatever it is, your passion, you want to work and do what you love. Um, that comes down to, like you just said, the value, um, you know, how much time am I saving people? How much, you know, am I improving their self-confidence? How much am I improving their health? Uh, those things are what's going to end up dictating, um, how much you can charge, Mm -hmm. um, how successful your business is. Uh, and I've learned, I mean, I, like I said, it's been a learning experience for me. I thought, well, damn, if I get, you know, 20,000 followers, I can just put out this ad and people are going to fucking buy. That's not the case at all. Um, it's really, you know, I've, uh, my business is bigger now. I mean, it's growing month by month, but it's, it's bigger now. And I don't, I could care less. I mean, I look at the metrics, but I could care less about the number of followers I have because I know with what we have in place and our customer support and the things that we do as far as providing value, I know that's going to dictate growth, right? That's what's going to get the job done hundred mm-hmm. percent of the time. Now looking forward, if you look ahead in the future, where are you going? Cause I mean, yeah. you're in fitness. That's primarily where you're at fitness, health and wellness, but you're also in personal growth. You talk a lot about other issues that are, I guess that you can always put them under the umbrella of total wellness, but they're really not fitness, right? Yeah. Where do you see yourself going moving ahead? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're in talks right now, um, more in the health space. Um, I hired a doctor, a PhD in nutrition actually to come on my team, uh, because, uh, my desire to help people with the mental side of health is a big one. I had an uncle recently commit suicide. Um, and, uh, that scares me like crazy cause I have two little boys. Um, I know they're going to grow up in a much different world than I grew up in. So my passion is kind of twofold. One, uh, on one hand, I have the generation that I'm a part of, right? I believe we're millennials. Uh, I guess technically I'm a millennial. Is that uh, what they call it? I think so. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> what year were you born? 85. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. think you are. Yeah. Well, technically I believe millennial. I am. Yeah. Maybe that or generation X or some shit. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah, my point cares? is, yeah, <laughs> I, there's two sides of the spectrum, right? So I have the side of the spectrum where it's people like myself, my peers, right? Guys who want more out of life and women, mothers, right? Who can relate to my wife who go, you know, I, I don't know where to, where to start. Um, I want to have a better life. I just, I want to be happier, but I don't know what to do. Maybe I, you know, we push them towards maybe just take care of your health and fitness, right? As a stepping stone to improving your life. That's one hand. But I also have this passion for the younger generation too, uh, because partly because I'm a dad, right? But also because I go, well, I want to have a resource for specifically young fathers who go, I don't know the fuck I'm doing, right? Like I, I'm like surrounded by social media. I'm surrounded by all these like, you know, highlight reels and the Joneses trying to keep up with them. And I'm kind of lost. I don't know what I should be focusing on as maybe an aspiring entrepreneur who wants to be a good dad, who also wants to be in shape, having resources for those people. So figuring out where's their attention, right? That's really what I'm focused on right now. So it's podcasting for sure, because I think that eventually radio is going to be gone and it's going to be straight podcasting. Um, and I do think too, that visually, 
uh, being on YouTube and whatever other platform allows you to do video is huge with connecting with that audience. So our business is really focused on, okay, what can we do with our peers, right? My age group. And then what can we do for people who are 10, 15 years younger than us that are coming into this, our world, right? Being introduced to us so they can go, okay, well, as I become a man or as I grow into an adult, and I start to have all these responsibilities, how can I utilize health and fitness or how can I have a resource to <laughs> take care of all these things that I'm supposed to take care of, right? Because I'm lost. I see all these people driving Lambos and Ty Lopez saying this and that. What am I supposed to do, right? So being a little more relatable, keeping a little more raw and real behind the scenes. Um, I think that's what, where we're headed, man. I think being extremely transparent is the future. I think that you have no choice. The more trans, yeah, you don't. I mean, but as transparent, like when you, so when I go, I don't know if we should share that you fucking share it. Like, that's it. You know what I mean? Like, that's my rule. Now, if I go, yeah, it's kind of too much share it because eventually it's going to come out. And I'd rather be the one who's leading the charge than being like, Oh, whoops, I missed the fucking boat. You you know, know? it's funny. The irony of that is when you're, 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 you know, you're scared to share something because you're afraid of how it's going to impact your, your business or what people are going to think or whatever. The irony of it is it protects you. More often than not, it yeah. protects you yep. because then you're so fucking real that, again, if something comes out or, or, or if you have enemies or competitors, or people don't like you, how are they going to fuck with you? They can't mess with you because you've already talked about that. You've already yeah. talked about and you your- see that a lot. I mean, in the fitness industry, especially you see oh. people getting exposed. Right. And it's like, well, dude, if you would have just fucking came out yeah. and, you know, like if you would have just said, said, hey, I stole your gym name. Right. Like you wouldn't be looked at as a cornball now. You know what I mean? Like you would have a little bit more. Like you would say, hey, I got inspired by that. You're like, thank you. Like mm-hmm. you inspired me to do this. Thank you, man. Like, you know, there isn't any of that. There's just egos. Like, no, I. what are you talking about? I don't know. Fuck. Like, you know, it's like I err on the side of, okay, maybe I share slightly too much. But then like you just said, you can't say shit, right? You can't blackmail me for shit. You, <laughs> you can't say I ever did this or I didn't do this or I stole this or because I, I already talked about it every possible thing, dude. Like you can't say, Oh, well, you know, I know he's not perfect with his wife. I saw them out. They were arguing. Fuck dude. I already talked about it. Yeah. Like oh, I, the had a podcast I talked audit. about on episode four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Excellent. You know, we have a, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that I know listen to the show and you're in a very unique place right now where you've already built a successful business that can provide for your family. And I know you have larger goals and that to continue to scale that. Um, talk about some of one, talk about some of the challenges with that. And then also share, I would love to hear what you think has been, uh, the most important position or person that you've added to your team to help accelerate that scaling process. Yeah. I mean, you know, along the journey of, of being an entrepreneur, you know, I, I flashed back to 2008 when it was my first, um, journey into it. I tried to become a financial planner. I had this whole idea that I was going to be like the wolf of wall street. Right. Um, I was chasing dollars. I was chasing status. You know, I was chasing uh, a, a cure for my insecurity, right? And I, I crashed hard because the market crashed. I was a 21 year old kid, no Rolodex, nobody to sell anything but life insurance to, and I was making nothing, right? I was broke as fuck, and I was living a life way beyond my means. It was a lot of mistakes, right? So I had that experience kind of in the past, and so when I decided, hey, I really want to take the online fitness business and I want to b- get serious about it and I actually want to do it. Um, there was this mentality that I that I had going into it that I didn't have with the financial planning. And that was, I know there's going to be a lot of struggles. I know it's going to suck. Like more times than not, it's probably going to suck. And I'm going to question myself a lot. And I'm probably going to have a lot of other people question me too. But no matter what, as long as I'm providing and as long as my business is growing and we're doing the right things and we see future growth and all these things coming down the line... I'm never going to give up. Never. Like no one can do shit. You have to fucking kill me to give up. Right. And that mentality has served me well because there's been many nights where I've cried with my wife. I don't have mud. We're not being able to pay the bills. I can't pay payroll. I can't pay for my, you know, this, that or whatever over the past few years. And I've been like that. Maybe that might be it. Right. Like I've lost business partners. I had business partners who will remain nameless <laughs> that fucked me. Right. And despite those things, I said, you know what? it happened for a reason. It's cool. I'm going to continue onward. So anybody listening, who's like, damn man, I'm struggling or whatever. Like you have to have that commitment because I think without commitment to something, if you're just doing it to say, Hey, I I want freedom or I want a paycheck or I want the status. It's probably not going to work. You have to have a commitment to something bigger than that. For me, it's a commitment to just me as, as who I am, who I, what legacy I am. When people show up to my funeral, like what they say, right? Like Josiah did this, he impacted me in this way. So that being said, I never want anybody to go, well, you know what? 
my dad used to be an entrepreneur and fuck man he gave up like he <laughs> he struggled so he said fuck it he went back to wearing a monkey suit or whatever right and so that drives me um coupled with that i think it's so easy to get distracted right it's so easy to uh with all the noise and all the marketing and the ads and everything and it's probably partially why zuckerberg is shutting this shit down uh is that we're we're bombarded with uh just temptations, right? What do we want? Well, we want to be successful. So these ads who go, I'm going to teach you how to take your online business from zero to six figures in 30 days. Like it's so easy to get distracted by that. It's so easy to fall into the trap of, well, well, this isn't working great. So I should try that. And I'm going to try this and that. And like, before you know it, you've made no progress on anything. So uh, avoiding those distractions, just being straight, like trying something until like, see it through, like just see it till till completion. Right. Uh, That's been a big thing. As far as like what about a position or a person that you've added to the team that yeah. you think has been the biggest help as far as scaling? Absolutely. I, I think the biggest lesson I've learned in the past year and a half is I'm not good at everything, right? I'm not going to be good at everything. I can sit on, take courses. I can go to mentorships. I can join masterminds. I can do all that, but I'm never going to be good at everything. What am I really good at? Connecting with people, coaching, right? I'm really good with podcasting. Those are things that nobody can do for me. I'm good at writing blogs, right? And I also enjoy those things. So that's what I need to do. Everything else, I fucking hire someone, right? Because otherwise, sure, I might be bootstrapping and trying to get through it and save expenses and building a business while I don't have all the resources to hire 20 different people. But when I know there's a specific need that we have and I'm not good at it, I need to at least find a way to get someone on my team that is. The number one hire I've made so far is a PhD in nutrition. Um, His name is Dr. Adrian Chavez. And uh, I brought him in because... I really wanted someone on my team who was passionate about the health side of things. It's not that I'm not, it's just, I'm not a PhD in nutrition. I don't know everything about cancer. I don't know everything about health and wellness and all those things. I'm passionate about helping people with it, but I don't know everything about it. And so I brought him in and it it really just, I mean, our business, I would almost say doubled overnight, especially with our front end product, simply because we had a whole nother piece to it that so many people need, right? And they're looking for, but it, there wasn't the combination of, okay, Josiah knows how to get me ripped, but then Dr. Adrian also knows how to get me healthy. There wasn't that. It was mm-hmm. too like, hey, lines drawn. It's either you're fucking trying to get a six pack or you're doing some gut health thing or whatever, right? There was no like, you know, c- together, like this is a team effort. We're doing both. Um, and I think it, would, it took a lot of courage for me to hire him because it was a commitment, obviously, to paying someone. Uh, before that, it was just me paying, you know, contractors, like someone to do my graphics, someone to do my website, all this stuff. But once I hired him on in a, about a year and some change ago, um, it, it just opened doors to so many new ways to grow our business um, and understand that I'm not good at everything. Like I'm not the expert on everything, dude. Uh, and now that's ch- translated to me hiring you know, this past year we hired 12 different people for different projects. Um, and so they're all things that I suck at though. And I think that's a step that not everybody's ready to take right away with entrepreneurship. I think you guys know, I mean, straight out of the gates, you don't always have payroll, like ready to go. Hey guys, I'm going to hire someone for 60 grand a year. It's probably not going to happen. Mm. But as you grow, instead of taking that money that, you know, deep down inside needs to be invested in people that do things that much better than you in certain areas and saying, no, oh, fuck that. I'm greedy. I'm going to keep it saying, I am not that great at these things. I need to hire people. And so that, yeah, it's a game changer, man. Oh, it's very difficult. Well, it's been, uh, cause we've seen you from make some incredible changes in growth. I mean, I remember when we first, you know, connected, I think it was through Instagram <laughs> yeah. and to see where you're at now with everything. It's pretty fucking cool, man. It's I really inspiring. That, man. And yeah. you deserve every bit of success that you have now and you're going to have in the future. Um, so, uh, much appreciate it. Thank you, dude. Definitely, definitely. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. It's Excellent, awesome. brother. Thanks. Listen, you can go on YouTube and check out Mind Pump TV. We're posting a 30-day workout on there. It's all programmed out and planned out for you, and it's absolutely for free uh, starting from day one all the way through the end of the month. Just go to YouTube, subscribe, Mind Pump TV. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. 
The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>